Hi, in this video we're going to speak about iterative macros and iterative macro creation through the Alteryx analytical platform. An iterative macro is probably best described as a module that will process a series of records on a continual loop until a certain condition is met. In this session, we're going to show you how to construct and leverage an iterative macro within an Alteryx process to determine the optimal trade area size for a series of stores based on population statistics in and around the surrounding area of the various stores. In order to illustrate the construction of an iterative macro, we're going to enter into the Alteryx Designer desktop. And the first thing that we're going to do in the environment is enter into the overarching properties configuration for the module. We'll toggle the type to become a macro, and we'll just choose this to become an iterative macro. Once we have this set, we can begin to design the visual workflow process that will encapsulate that macro process. The first thing that we're going to do is enter into our interfacing tools. We're going to go ahead and click and drag onto the canvas a macro input tool. We're going to configure this to look directly at uh, a file input. At this point, I'm going to navigate out to my file system and consume into the application a file called start. The file contains a series of pet store locations inside of the Wyoming uh, region, and it will contain a point-based spatial object. We'll also change the input name to become input, and we'll choose the connector abbreviation to become I. In this case, we're not going to show any field mappings, even though the process does require a spatial object to run. In parallel, what we'll also do is enter into some of our demographic data uh, tool sets, and we'll click and drag onto the canvas and allocate input tool. Through the allocate input tool, we're actually going to pull in a series of block groups for the Wyoming state and actually append the population variable directly to those geographies. The reason why we're doing this is because we would like to construct a series of trade areas based off of the population size that occupies a particular radius in and around that store location. Once I do this, what we're able to do is begin to define how we're going to iterate through the process. In this case, we're going to make it so that the trade area size will grow as the process loops, meaning that we're going to increase the radius in miles each and every time the process is run until a certain population threshold is met, which will mean that we finally determine the proper size for the varying store trade areas for each location inside of my source. So in this case here, my output field becomes trade area size. And what, how we're going to scale this is what we're going to do is enter into the constants and grab that iteration number and add one, meaning that we're going to add one mile each time the process is run, subsequently increasing the trade area size until we hit that population threshold and that total population threshold is accounted for. Once we've done that, we can enter into some of the spatial tools and begin to define that trade area where we can actually read from the newly constructed field and apply that uh, trade area size from that trade area size field in radius and miles. Then what we can do is we can begin to run a spatial match process where we can actually stream the trade areas directly into the target and we can take our block group data and stream it into the universe, establish a relationship between the two files where the store trade area contains a series of block group data. So we can just change this to be the store object trade area, contains our spatial object and we can begin to carry this information down. Once we begin to bring the information down, we have to do some simple aggregation in order to determine the total population size contained inside of that trade area. So we'll go into the transform tools, grab that summarize tool, we'll group by the store name, we'll go ahead and carry down the spatial object for the store, okay? So what we can do is uh, bring down the first instance of that store-based spatial object, as well as the newly constructed trade area size, so we'll bring down that first object as well. And then what we'll also do is bring down some key statistics, okay? So what we'll do is we'll bring down that population number, we'll numerically aggregate this, so instead of calling it sum uh, and its alias, we'll actually rename this field to become total pop, which will then be leveraged inside of our filter to determine how we iterate through this process. Once we have the sum built, we can enter into our data preparation tools and we can grab a filter tool. 
This filter tool is going to help us isolate which records are done processing because they've met a certain filter condition or total population threshold, and which records we have to loop back through the process to increase the trade area size to accommodate for additional population. So the filter that we're going to apply in this case will be where the population is greater than or equal to 30,000. That's when we want to stop the process for increasing the trade area size for a series of stores. The result of the true stream becomes the stores that we're done with, okay? And we've already set the uh, trade area value. So what we can do is click and drag onto the canvas the macro output. This macro output becomes our finished stores. And the connector abbreviation that we'll use is R for results. The stores that do not meet the filter criteria will filter out under the F stream and these become the records that we then need to feed back through the process to increase the trade area size to meet our population threshold. In order to do that, what we're gonna do then is rejoin this information back to our store stream to make sure that we have all of the relevant data to appropriately filter back through the process. You really wanna make sure that the record structure or the table structure is gonna be identical. And the best way to do that is just to simply remerge the information together and bring back only the data that you had at the origination point. So all I'm going to do is choose to bring all of the right stream back, which is the source of my macro input. We're going to take the result of that inner join, and then what we'll do is we'll grab an interface tool, put a macro output on here, and we'll call this the records to iterate through the connector abbreviation becomes I, and we can move this through. Now, the entire process at this point is complete, but there's one last thing that we have to do. We have to specify or tell the macro which records are gonna iterate and which input is gonna accept those iterating records. In order to do so, what we can do is go to the View drop-down menu and show the interface designer. Through here, we can toggle over to the properties, and this is where we're gonna be able to specify which tool is going to be the iteration input. In this case, it's going to be my only uh, macro input on the canvas. And then my iteration output is going to be the iterate stream. Users can specify the maximum number of iterations to run to ensure that this doesn't loop infinitely, okay, and that there is a termination point. But in this case here, we're only looping through about 13 records, so this threshold shouldn't really matter, and we should never really hit that maximum number. But if I should, Users can then define uh, how we handle that. Okay, are we going to throw an error? Are we going to throw a warning or just output the leftover records? In this case, we'll throw an error. Um, and then what we can also do is set the output mode, meaning what does is, what is the union look like for all of these resultant sets? And all we're going to do is toggle this to be auto-configured by name. Now that the process is set, what we can do is save this out as our iterative macro and then open up a brand new blank canvas to show you how we can implement it. So what we're going to do to show you how this works is just click and drag onto the canvas and input tool. We're going to navigate to our file system. We'll consume into the application that starting point set of data that will contain our pet store data with our point based spatial object. We'll right click on the canvas and insert our iterative macro and stream the data directly inside of there and put some browse tools uh, on the end to show the results. Now, if this runs correctly, the stream containing the records to iterate through should be blank, meaning that no records should be left over unless that population threshold doesn't get met, at which point an error will be thrown in my output log. I'm going to go ahead and run this now, and we're actually going to see how this iterative process works. What you're going to see is an output log being constructed. It'll, it'll detail how many iterations or how many times that underlying process is being run and how many records are actually left over. Now, if you recall, we, we set a limitation that this will only run in upwards of 100 iterations, at which point it will terminate, and I'll actually terminate with an error. So if, if these last two remaining records uh, do not have a constructed tree area for it, um, we're gonna see a, an error message pop through in our output log. Ideally, though, I'd like to think that we should be able to get a tree area constructed for all of these points, with one of these trade areas uh, that's probably going to be rather large. So 
As I suspected, we have no data coming through our iterative output because all records had a uh, trade area constructed. And then what we could do is take a look at the result sets here and see all of those records being constructed in full. If I zoom in here, we can see those trade areas as well. And we can see the records and how, how they were uh, processed. This concludes our demonstration of the iterative macro demo. Thank you.